Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Warm greetings to everyone and welcome to this FAO webinar on the global synthesis of World Aquaculture 2020, which is wrapping up a series of webinars on regional aquaculture reviews this week. This event is organized by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations in anticipation of the Global Conference on Aquaculture 2020, which was supposed to be held during this week in Shanghai, China, together with our partner, the Network of Aquaculture Centers in Asia Pacific, and our host, the Chinese Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs, and which had to be postponed to September 2021. My name is Matthias Halvard. I'm the head of FAO's aquaculture branch and will be your moderator for today's event. Thank you all for joining us here. Let me start first with a few notes under housekeeping. First, at the bottom of your screen, you will find a chat button, which will be open as of now. Second, please be sure to use the question and answer box to submit your questions and your comments. This question and answer box is being monitored by the Secretariat. And when you make a comment or when you pose a question, please identify who the question is for. And finally, please note that we are recording this webinar and expect to make it available later on on, a, on the dedicated uh, GCA website. So we have a full agenda today, and I will include this brief introduction by saying thank you to our presenters and panelists and to all of you for attending. Before we start with our panel presentations and discussions, I have the great pleasure and honor to invite Manuel Barange, Director of FAO's Fisheries Division, to deliver his welcome remarks. Manuel, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Matthias, and good afternoon, good morning, or good evening to everyone, wherever you are. Uh, normally in these events, as everyone in FAO knows, uh, the person opening events is given speaking notes to make sure that they provide a good background and context to the discussions that follow. This time, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to throw the notes and just speak to the heart at a time where we all find ourselves in a very difficult situation. The COVID-19 pandemic has created havoc around the world. We have been very, very worried about the economic impacts of the pandemic, as well as the health impacts of the pandemic. And we've also been very concerned over the consequences for food security. And as whatever you are, you would have realized that the situation now is possibly as bad as it was at the beginning of the pandemic, the beginning of 2020. And we all face a very difficult, difficult reality. As you know, the FAO's mandate is to fight, is to, is to fight for a world without hunger and poverty. And we have currently in the latest estimation, 690 million people that are hungry in the world. And that is 60 million more than in 2014. So we're going in the wrong direction. And the recent estimates of FAO is that this figure can increase by up to 100 million people in 2020 alone as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. These figures have been revised uh, every week by FAO and the World Bank, but certainly are sobering and focus our minds. We need to fight again for hunger, for the end of hunger and the end of malnutrition. And aquaculture has been crucial to this already for some time. As you all know, 25 years ago, um, we were producing, aquaculture was producing 24 million tons of um, fish, mollusks, and crustaceans. Um, we now produce 82 million tons, or in 2018 at least. 46% um, of the fish products produced, 46%. By 2030, we expect this figure of 82 million tons to grow to about 108 million tons. That's about a 32% growth between now and 2030. And if that is maintained, then the expectations of FAO is that that would be 
54% of all fish products. And by fish products, I mean fish, mollusks, and crustaceans, in addition to the seaweed production, which aquaculture produces at a very large volume. So how do we get there is perhaps the most important question that we all have to remember when you look at these um, regional reviews and the messages that we give to the world as to what is the state of aquaculture worldwide. If we have to grow from now by 30%, considering that aquaculture has already been the fastest growing food production industry for the last five decades, we need to do a lot more. And we often talk about ensuring that we have a sustainable intensification of aquaculture between now and 2030. And that sustainable intensification means a number of things. It means technical support, it means investment, it means technological innovation, it means value chain developments, it means improvements in the, in the genetic strains that have been um, cultured and, in, and all the animal health associated with that. And of course, at the bottom or at the top, all the normative work as to what guidelines do we need, what support do we need regionally, globally, so that that sustainable intensification is truly sustainable and is truly for the long term. So the landscape is quite clear. The path is quite clear. Where we want to get to is quite clear and the need for it, I hope it is also clear. But in order to move in this direction, you need to know exactly what is the baseline. Where are you starting from? And this is where these regional reviews are so important and where the global uh, assessment is so important. We need to know where we are. We need to send very clear messages, messages that are not just words, but give indications to those that want to invest in aquaculture, those that want to grow um, fish in ponds, those that want to market, and those, the consumer that wants to consume uh, fish products as well, that they have the guidance required so that we move to in this decade of implementation of, of the SDGs, because you will know that this is the, we entering the decade of implementation of the sustainable development goals. But by the end of that decade, we have achieved those goals of sustainable intensification on aqu of aquaculture. And with that, uh, Matthias and distinguished delegates, um, this has been perhaps a less formal opening that we normally have, and I didn't want to do it in any other way. But I'm looking forward to the discussions, to the presentations, and to the messages that you have to give me and give the world and give FAO so that we can support this industry and we can support those that depend on this industry. Thank you very much, Matthias. Over to you. And thank you very much, Manuel. And uh, I'm sure that we can meet your aspiration. We will now continue with the program. And uh, please allow me to just briefly walk you through it. Um, we will start with opening remarks by Antonio Garza de Ita from Mexico. Um, this will be, this will be uh, followed by um, the main presentation for today, the global synthesis with key messages and way forward emerging from the six regional reviews presented over the last three days. And this will be given by the lead author, Dr. Devin Bartley. Following this, we will listen to three short uh, pre-recorded presentations from invited experts who are all present with us in this webinar as panelists. And then we will have a question and answer session and we will conclude with closing remarks by Maria Helena Semedo, the Deputy Director General of FAO who will uh, join us at a later point uh, in the webinar. So without further ado, we will begin now with opening remarks from Antonio Garza de Ita. Antonio holds the position of Secretary of Fisheries and Aquaculture for the state of Tamaulipas, Mexico. He serves as the president of the Latin America chapter of Aquaculture Without Frontiers, and is president-elect of the World Aquaculture Society. But most of all, his dedication is that of an aquaculture enthusiast. Secretariat, could you please share the screen and play the video?
Welcome to this summary of the State of World Aquaculture 2020. First of all, I would like to congratulate the FAO team, including all consultants and staff, on the efforts in putting together the six regional reviews that preceded this global overview. I want to thank FAO for the honor conferred to myself, the State of Tamaulipas, and the World Aquaculture Society to address all the aquaculture professionals and enthusiasts in the world during these opening remarks. Aquaculture is as diverse as are the regions of the world. Numerous species, countless environments, many different farm sizes and levels of technology, a variety of approaches and goals. With something in Asia, aquaculture's main purpose is to produce affordable species for food. In other regions of the world, it is to produce high value products for local consumption or exports. It is not surprising for anybody that aquaculture is an Asian phenomenon, with China leading world production in a substantial way. Nevertheless, worldwide, the most common constant of aquaculture is its continuous growth. Even in regions where growth has slowed down, as in North America, there are important initiatives to promote the activity. The reason of why this trend is going to continue for many years is simple. Aquaculture is the most efficient and sustainable way of producing protein in the world. Average seafood consumption in the world is 20.5 kilograms per capita per year and growing. However, consumption is not evenly distributed among nations. Developed and developing countries have high seafood, while in less developed nations, there is a deficit in both demand and supply for reasons that include affordability of seafood and food culture. In all nations, better affordability, processing, extended shelf life, and value-added products will encourage adding seafood products to diets. Nevertheless, regardless of size or location, the aquaculture industry everywhere shares similar needs and faces similar challenges that will only be mitigated by us all working together. Some of our pressing needs are fish protein and fish oil, need to be reduced or eliminated from aquatic feeds to allow aquaculture to continue growing. Solid genetic programs need to continue to address the adaptability of species, disease resistance, and desirable production traits such as growth rate and food conversion ratio. We must build a solid and resilient industry. Aquaculture does not only need to adapt and take preventive measures for climate change, but also for financial and multivariable crises such as the one generated by COVID-19. Capacity building programs should aim to the professionalization of the industry in all the value chain and at all levels, including government personnel that needs to be able to take decisions based on the most recent scientific information available. Thorough strategic planning is essential and it must encompass various subsets of, in, of the industry, such as marketing, service providers, capacity building, investment and financing, seafood consumption, promotion, digitalization, seafood trade negotiations, development of trade cooperatives and associations, and very importantly, regional cooperation. Aquaculture needs to be an instrument to improve the quality of life of the people engaged in it. It should be a good tool to promote the inclusion of women and the young in rural development, thus reducing rural migration. My vision for the future of aquaculture is very positive. It cannot be otherwise, since aquaculture is my life and passion. I can see innovation being a major disruptor of the status quo. While recirculating aquaculture systems and offshore cages will become more important, biotechnology, such as tissue culture and cellular seafood production, will become major players in the industry. I see circular economy as a concept being embraced by the industry where all byproducts are utilized, maximiz maximizing resource usage and decreasing environmental footprints to a minimum. In the long run, I envision livestock produced worldwide being fed protein produced by aquaculture of aquatic plants. I look forward to aquaculture becoming the major source of protein and the culmination of the Blue Revolution. However, for the near future, aquaculture needs to aim towards specific goals. First, aquaculture needs to concentrate efforts on it decreasing its environmental footprint 
in all the value chain from production to distribution, including all the side industries associated with it, such as processing, storage, and feed manufacturing. Aquaculture needs to become a national priority in every region and country. Recently, aquaculture has been in the minds and speeches of most decision makers, but that has rarely been reflected in national budgets and priorities. Public and private investment is crucial for aquaculture to keep expanding. Scientific and policy cooperation within and between regions needs to be more active and efficient. Regional and global aquaculture organizations, such as NACA, the World Aquaculture Society, and most preponderantly FAO, will play a major role as platforms to facilitate dialogue for producers, service providers, academia, consumers, financing agents, decision makers, and all stakeholders who work together. Next year's conf global conference in aquaculture will be a great opportunity and exercise to keep adding effort towards pushing the Blue Road agenda and building a solid future for aquaculture. Looking forward to seeing you all in Shanghai in September 2021. Well, thank you Anton, to Antonio for these opening remarks and highlighting in a very clear way the prospects of an aquaculture sector that uses resources much more efficiently than other sectors to produce proteins and indeed micronutrients for better food and nutrition. And you touched upon some very important aspects such as the inclusion of women and youth in aquaculture as part of rural development and related reduced migration. And indeed, we hope to see in the long run also larger scale applications of aquatic plants for a variety of uses, including in the livestock sector. So I would now like to introduce the lead author of the regional review, Dr. Devin Bartley. Devin is a longtime friend and colleague who recently retired from FAO, where he spent most of his professional career indeed 24 years in the fisheries and aquaculture department. He served for two years as the state aquaculture coordinator in California. And Devin is now a part-time professor at Michigan State University and a senior research associate at World Fisheries Trust in Canada. Devin, may I ask you to share your screen, please? Thank you, Matthias, and good afternoon, good evening to everyone uh, here in California. It's a very good morning, and I'm just looking here for my, my presentation. that I hope you can, I hope you can all see. Thank you, Devin. We see your screen. The floor is yours. Great. Well, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here in this distinguished group of, of speakers and panelists and, and friends and colleagues. Even though I am the, the main author, I'm really just the the synthesizer of the six regional reviews. And I encourage everyone to go to that, to those original reviews for a much more in-depth treatment of uh, regional aquaculture. The, the coverage in this, <clears throat> excuse me, this review of course will be global. The main data sources in addition to those regional reviews are the FAO State of World Fisheries and Aquaculture, uh, FISH.J database, academic literature, the FAO agricultural database, FAO stat, FAO and UN publications, and very importantly, FAO staff that has guided myself and the authors of the regional reviews through a, a maze of, of important information. Looking at past trends and then continuing trends, what we see is perhaps no surprise, uh, as Antonio said, aquaculture is increasing with Asia leading the pack. Trade in fish and fish products is growing. Aquaculture continues to compete for resources. 
aquaculture uses a variety of species, farming systems and intensity, and sustainability issues are still looming large for the sector. The new, the new trends perhaps are there's an increased call for value added products. The nutritional value of aquaculture products are being promoted. New systems are coming online such as BioFlock and aquaponics, although they're still at a pretty low scale right now. Information technology is increasing rapidly with the use of cell phones and digital technology. And sadly, as Manuel mentioned, uh, COVID-19 has seriously impacted the sector. To the key messages, not surprisingly, aquaculture continues to grow. If you look at this graph down here on the, on the right, the blue lines are aquaculture production, which you can see steadily increasing. The orange lines are capture fisheries production and capture fisheries has pretty much uh, reached the limit, the biological limits of, of our oceans and, and fresh waters. 2018 was a, was a record year for aquaculture production with over 114 million metric tons produced valued at uh, over $260 billion. Asia and China, primarily China is the top producer. Developing countries continue to produce the majority of farm uh, products. There are a few developed countries that are very strong producers and in a few areas such as Oceania and Northern America, even though aquaculture production has plateaued, there are policies in place to, um, to help increase the production from the sector. Moving ahead here, well, I hope that's what the next slides, the following slides will show. Well, aquaculture is one of the most diverse food producing sectors. There's a variety of farming systems from cages, ponds, raceways, intensive recirculating systems to uh, low input extensive systems. And it includes both small scale and large scale operations. Aquaculture works in a variety of habitats from temperate seas, even Arctic seas to tropical rice fields. The world farms close to 500 species or species items that are composed of fish, mollusks, echinoderms, crustaceans, vascular plants, seaweeds, and even microorganisms. As I mentioned, there's new systems coming on board. However, in this diversity, we must make sure that we balance the small scale producers with the large scale producers. Moving away here, we have to examine ways to further diversify the sector and that includes not only species and farming system diversification, but the diversification of markets. And we should keep in mind that diversity is not a goal in its end in itself, but it's a mechanism to ensure that systems meet the local conditions and the local objectives. And I think also we have to take care to not marginalize the small scale producers. Innovation is happening and should continue to happen. Antonio and Manuel laid the background for this. We have tremendous progress in disease diagnosis and treatment, and this has resulted in a dramatic decrease in the use of antibiotics. Genetic technologies exist and they're de being developed rapidly. However, even traditional genetic technologies are not being fully utilized. There are improvements in farming systems going towards a sustainable intensification with recirculating systems and integrated multi-trophic level aquaculture. However, IMTA does have problems in some areas due to the difficulties in producing multiple products, um, the difficulties of multiple markets and even licensing, licensing difficulties in some areas. Digital technologies are increasing the flow and hopefully the accuracy of information. And most recently, bivalve and seaweed farming have been put forward as not only providing an aquaculture product, but also in providing valuable ecosystem services. Now, with all this innovation, again, we must take care that the innovations and the technologies 
are being available, being made available to small scale producers. Moving away here, we need to increase local capacity uh, with technology transfer. We need to promote realistic advantages of the new technologies. We need to help small scale and rural farmers access those technologies. I think the uh, examination of ecosystem benefits of bivalves and seaweed farming should be much more um, fully investigated. However, I'd like to conclude this slide by saying that we should not abandon proven technologies on the shelf technologies that are already working very well. Don't abandon them just for the new flavor of the month or the trendy technology. Um, aquaculture is not homogenous globally, nor within regions. This graph here on the um, upper right shows the trajectory of the different regions as far as aquaculture production goes. And because China and Asia are such strong producers, we have to use even separate axes to, to adequately capture that production. Um, so the regions certainly are not at the same level of, of production. Within a region, it's also extremely diverse. On the lower graph, we see China and the uh, Laos uh, Democratic uh, Republic. And China, again, as I've said, is such a strong producer, we have to use a logarithmic scale because China actually produces about three or four orders of magnitude more product than Laos. Looking at a developed region, for example, uh, Europe, we see Norway and Germany, and you might think, well, the production there is quite similar, but in fact, Norway farms two orders of magnitude more than Germany. So what works for China may not work for Laos at this time. What works for Norway may not work for, for Germany at this time. Moving away and moving forward here, regional approaches are good, but they must be made with caution. And I think as Antonio said, we need to, <clears throat> excuse me, emphasize regional cooperation and harmonization of aquaculture policies where that's important and appropriate. Now, keeping with the diversity theme, uh, aquaculture produces a diversity of projects, uh, products, excuse me, regions combine high and lower value species to enhance their efficiency. Again, uh, 2018 was a banner year in production. It also was a record year in value with um, aquaculture value increasing from just 552 billion tons in the year 2000 to over $260 billion, sorry, not tons, but dollars in 2018. The highest valued products are white leg shrimp, Atlantic salmon, grass carp, silver carp, and red swamp crayfish is, is rising very quickly. Um, seaweeds and many other freshwater fishes often command a lower per unit price. And that's basically for different markets and for different purposes. You can see this table here on the right. Each region has its preferred species. These are the top five species by value in each region. And you can see um, for example, South America farms quite high value species for export. Um, Asia has high value species, but actually Asia produces more uh, on a ton basis of lower value species, um, seaweed and, and species that feed lower on the food chain. Moving forward here, we need to match products with lo local objectives and preferences. Are these species being produced for local food security or for export? And I think uh, given the increase in demand for value added, we need to look at what species can we add value to through better processing and, and whatnot. Um, aquaculture is an efficient user of fish in aqua feeds. Aquaculture has been criticized for feeding fish to fish Many people think you should feed fish to people. And this graph on the, on the right shows that over the past several decades, about more or less 5 million metric tons of forage fish have been used in aqua feeds. At the same time, those black bars show the production uh, increase in aquaculture. 
So while the use of forage fish has remained constant, aquaculture production through better feed formulation, better husbandry, husbandry has dramatically increased. Now, um, the industry is looking for uh, replacements to fish meal, and this is uh, moving ahead well. Uh, it, it turns out that we can replace fish meal in diets. Replacing fish oil is a little bit different. And the, um, the solutions are land-based plant uh, proteins and oils. But I think we have to look at the footprint of that land-based production. Moving forward here, I think we need to encourage in the development of good aquafeeds, perhaps at sub-regional or local levels. All of the reviews showed that when fish are fed well, they grow very well. Whether it's locally produced good feed or imported feed, it really helps aquaculture production. I think efforts should continue to replace fish in aqua feeds, but I don't think this should unduly impact the responsible use of forage fish. That in itself is an important industry providing livelihoods to those people that fish uh, primarily in uh, Latin America for forage feeds. And I think we have to analyze the trade-offs between replacing fish in diets uh, with land-based uh, plant material. Aquaculture can and should provide decent employment. Over 20 million people are employed in the aquaculture industry. And a lot of this employment, uh, it's in the post-harvest sector and the processing sector, but it's also in areas where other employment options are not available. Women play an especially important role um, in, uh, in all phases of the value chain, especially in processing. And even though there's more people involved in captured fisheries, more women, there's a higher percentage of women involved in aquaculture. Those are good news. Uh, however, uh, the regional reviews did report problems with um, workers' rights, uh, occupational um, safety and worker safety issues um, have been noted in some areas, as well as um, aquaculture development um, denying access to traditional fishing grounds on some coastal areas. Moving forward here, we need to promote and implement aquaculture as a provider of decent employment, especially in areas where there aren't very many other options. We need to examine women's role in, in the value chain and follow that up with good policy actions. We need to promote aquaculture as a mean to provide opportunities and employment for women, not only employment for women, but when women are involved in the sector, they can take that knowledge of good nutrition back home and feed it to their families. We need to continue to ensure that human and workers' rights are respected in aquaculture development plans and ensure that workers' um, safety is maintained um, in, in farming operations. Trade in aquaculture, <clears throat> excuse me, is important. It's diverse within and among regions and we need better information on it. Seafood is one of the large, world's largest traded commodities, but again, this trade is not homogenous. Europe and the USA must import fish and fish, fish products to meet their consumer demands. Sub-Saharan Africa, most fish are produced and consumed within the region, even though there are um, some imports from abroad. In Latin America, the majority of aquaculture products are exported. There's an increased demand for frozen, uh, pre-packaged convenience foods, especially in Europe and uh, Northern America. In uh, the Near East and, and North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, Aquaculture products are generally marketed fresh, unprocessed with very little or no value adding. And in all region, trade statistics were noted to be incomplete and basically fail to distinguish farmed products from fish products in the value chain. Moving ahead here, we need to improve access to mechanisms that help provide accurate information to policymakers and consumers such as the um, InfoFish Network and the Globefish trade publications. We need to encourage access to new information technology, such as uh, cell phones and digital information, 
that will hopefully increase the flow and accuracy of information. And again, examine the benefits of value adding where this can, can add um, economic resources to the value chain. Now, there are market tools that promote sustainability and these have potential. And what I'm talking about here are the um, eco labeling and aquaculture certification guidelines. Um, however, are these effective? In some areas, uh, certified aquaculture products do command a higher price and that price is increasing, but more information from around the world is needed. For example, in Europe, um, certified Atlantic salmon, consumers are willing to pay a higher price for that. Certified carp is not so popular. Now, there is a concern that even though these, um, these market mechanisms to improve sustainability are good in theory, they could adversely impact small scale producers and um, aquaculture producers in developing areas. And these are the exact this is the exact dialogue that happened decades ago in the subcommittee on aquaculture when eco-labeling and certification were first being mentioned at, in the international agenda. Moving ahead here, we need to promote more widely these guidelines, the, the FAO guidelines on aquaculture certification and best aquaculture practices. We need to conduct market and consumer studies to examine critically the efficacy and impact of certification and eco-labeling. And then we need to develop mechanisms to make sure that small scale producers in rural areas are not adversely impacted and they too have the advantage of eco-labeling. I should also say that many governments provide such strict um, growing guidelines that uh, for example, here in the US, the USDA and the California um, regulatory system, if a farmer can meet those requirements, there, there may often not be a need for additional eco-labeling. Aquaculture produces nutritious and safe food and should emphasize human, environment, and organismal health. FAO has defined four pillars of food security, that is food that's available, food that's accessible, it's utilizable, and it's stable and aquaculture is providing an affordable and steady supply of farmed fish that in many areas, it's difficult for the capture fisheries to supply in the same manner. Several reviews, however, did indicate that aquaculture products, which are mainly larger fish and often fillets of those larger fish are in fact not improving nutrition at local levels because those, those products are being exported. Moving forward here, I think we have to mainstream nutrition and aquaculture development product um, policies. We need to engage and promote, <clears throat> excuse me, the concept of sustainable food systems and value chains. And we have to support local communities to, to ensure that, look, that they are not adversely impacted. And we can <clears throat> actually help to improve the nutritional content of farmed fish. Um, one, through diversifying the, the, the kinds of fish that, that consumers eat, but also the farmed product itself can be made more nutritious through enhanced aquafeeds and through genetic selection for improved nutrition. Climate change and COVID were identified by every region as important external factors. One year ago, when the uh, reviews were started, climate change was the most uh, common external factor noticed, noted. However, recently, sadly, COVID-19 has come to the forefront as, as Manuel has mentioned. And there's differential impacts on the sector depending on the environment and the capacity to adapt. COVID-19 is already disrupting the sector tremendously. However, I don't wanna to say too much more about that right now because the long-term impacts have not been decided. China as a major aquaculture producer was severely impacted early on. However, I just heard a report last week that the Chinese agriculture industry has fully recovered and is increasing production 
And basically that's due to the lockdown in other regions of um, uh, the, the lockdown of the supply chain in other regions. So China is stepping up and filling that gap. We have noticed a difference between global events such as the pandemic and local events such as fires and tsunamis. Uh, the fires here in California and Australia, we had people moving between continents to help fight those fires. With the global pandemic, this isn't possible. There are other concerns, of course, that have come up. Uh, pollution, habitat degradation also loomed large. Moving ahead here, I think many of the preceding messages will promote a more resilient and vital aquaculture sector that's capable of adapting to these external factors. All of the regional reviews noted that disaster preparedness was lacking. And I think we really must look at how to increase emergency responses and disaster preparedness in the aquaculture sector. Good governance is increasing, but more is needed. This little diagram up here on the, uh, on the upper right shows us that aquaculture does not exist in a vacuum. It exists in an in a environment, a mosaic of food production sectors, but of other economic sectors as well, tourism, agriculture. And sadly, aquaculture is not well integrated into national policies. Planning, spatial planning, zoning, environmental impact analysis are being used to help improve the sustainability and social acceptance of the sector. And pretty much in, in many areas, there's a huge regulatory burden that's placed on the sector. Often the mosaic that I mentioned was well established before aquaculture entered the scene. Aquaculture is a relatively new um, endeavor in, in most regions. It's sort of the last kid on the block and therefore the regulatory burden is often more intense for that new sector. Moving forward here, we need to harmonize policies within ministries and among countries. Aquaculture often falls between the gaps uh, between fisheries and agriculture. We need to integrate aquaculture into national development strategy with adequate resources and with adequate safeguards. We need to establish farmer associations and producer organizations to give aquaculture a stronger representation uh, and a stronger voice in policy making. We need to communicate the value of aquaculture more widely and we need to strengthen intergovernmental collaboration on aquaculture um, through mechanisms such as the FAO's COFI Subcommittee on Aquaculture and other intergovernmental fora such as NACA and uh, the World Fish Center. Now, um, aquaculture stakeholders need to proactively, and I should put proactively in caps there, work to improve its image. Um, aquaculture in some areas does suffer, suffer from poor public perception, um, social licensing and uh, this poor perception are hindering the development. There's environment concerns, there's animal welfare concerns, human health aspects, access to resource land and water. And then of course, there's just basic economic concerns from the capture fishery um, sector. Moving ahead here, we need to emphasize and improve environmental and social sustainability. I think we can do this and highlight success stories um, using the framework of the Sustainable Aquaculture Program, the Sustainable Development Goals, the One Health, uh, and whatnot. And that's what this graph over here, this figure on the right shows that the One Health emphasizes organismal health, environmental health, and human health. And we can frame aquaculture as meeting all of these criteria for a, a healthy society. And I think we need to engage other stakeholders as we integrate ourselves into this mosaic uh, uh, landscape. And we have to recognize that aquaculture is not for all places at all, at all times. There are other legitimate uses of land and water. Finally, aquaculture can help achieve the Agenda 2030, its Sustainable Development Goals, and other important international com commitments. Aquaculture is directly contributing to a number of the Sustainable Development Goals. It's indirectly contributing to many more. 
Each region has opportunities and advantages and challenges in implementing the, the goals. And there are new ways of looking at aquaculture. And these new ways uh, focus beyond number of tons produced and number of, of dollars uh, traded or sold, and instead focus on positive out outcomes for local communities in the form of nutrition, livelihoods, and food security. Moving forward here, I think it's important to note that, that you don't just choose one sustainable development goal, but they are a package and uh, trying to implement all 17. And I think we have to um, assess and evaluate and enable aquaculture in terms of the implementation of those sustainable development goals. I think the new policies and this new framework of looking at aquaculture should be embraced by policymakers in the industry and I think importantly, FAO and NACA that monitor on a global and regional scale, the sector, those organizations have to embrace this new framework and maybe start looking for markers um, other than, than, than tons produced and, and dollars sold that really indicate uh, environmental health and human health um, along with those traditional measures of, of aquaculture development. And I think here we're at the end. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a real pleasure. I will stop sharing my screen now. Over to you, Mateus, and I will mute myself. Well, thank you very much, Devin, for this excellent presentation, highlighting key messages and suggesting ways forward. There were 14 key messages and many associated and prioritized options for a way forward. And I expect that we will receive quite a lot of feedback on these in the question and answer box from the audience. We now continue with some recorded remarks from our additional panelists. All of them are here with us today. So please remember if you want to ask either our lead author or any of the panelists a question, please use the question and answer box, not the chat box, and identify yourself and to whom you would like to direct your question. So um, we will now start with these um, presentations uh, of three panelists, and I will just briefly introduce them to you. The first of them is Dr. Shakuntala Tilstead. Shakuntala is the research program leader of value chains and nutrition at World Fish Center based at the headquarters in Penang, Malaysia. And she is engaged in the nutrition sensitive aquaculture in several countries in Africa, Asia and the Pacific building on work done in Bangladesh. Second, uh, our panelist is Semoli Belemane. Belemane is the Chief Director for Aquaculture and Economic Development and Head of the Oceans Economy Aquaculture Workstream at the Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries of South Africa. And finally, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Cecile Bruger who is also a former FAO colleague and now director of Soulfish Research and Consultancy based in the UK and a member of the International Organization for Women in the Seafood Industry. So with this short introduction of our panelists, Secretariat, could you please share the screen and play the video? Thank you. Mainstreaming nutrition in aquaculture. One of the fundaments of mainstreaming human nutrition in aquaculture, as it is for agriculture in general, is diversity of species within production systems. It has been shown that aquaculture systems with large sized and small sized fish species result in higher total production and productivity. 
in addition to large increases in the nutritional quality of the total production. In particular, the amounts of vitamins and minerals and essential fatty acids produced are greatly increased. We have seen evidence of this from pond polyculture systems in Bangladesh, Nepal, Cambodia, Myanmar, and India. Having the fish in the pond is not sufficient for mainstreaming nutrition. In addition to selling the fish produce, it must also be consumed in the household by women and children. This entails integration of women-friendly harvesting methods, social behavior change actions, and nutrition messaging for increased fish consumption. Engaging women in small-scale aquaculture has shown to benefit both household consumption of fish, as well as purchase of nutrient-rich foods from the sale of fish. Fish is not consumed alone, and aquaculture is not the only production system in which households are engaged. Therefore, we have extended mainstreaming nutrition in aquaculture to also include production of nutrient-rich vegetables on pond dikes and in homestead gardens. To mainstream human nutrition in aquaculture for maximum benefits, nutrition sensitive goals and targets must be set from the beginning of the aquaculture intervention. Nutrition sensitive measures must be monitored regularly. These measures include species diversity and species production, household consumption of fish at species and intra-household level, sale of fish, foods bought from the income of sale of fish, and women's engagement and the time they spend on aquaculture. These nutrition sensitive measures can be monitored using a subsample of aquaculture and non-aquaculture households. These data can then provide an assessment of the impact of aquaculture and nutrition using well-established indicators such as dietary diversity, diet quality, nutrient contribution from aquaculture in relation to dietary recommendations, and anthropometric measures in both children and adults. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Belamani Salim Simudi. I work for the Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries in South Africa. I'm the Chief Director responsible for Agriculture and Economic Development. My intervention today is on the importance of um, collaboration uh, within the region and globally towards the sustainable development of aquaculture. My intervention is based on five key areas. The first one is on capacity building. Second one is on expertise. The third area is on infrastructure. Area number four is information and knowledge sharing. Finally, uh, area number five will be technology development and transfer. When it comes to area number one, which is capacity building, it's important for us as regions to leverage on each other's capacity strengths so that we can empower other regions that don't have capacity in certain areas or fields within the agriculture sector. Area number two, which is the expertise. Um, aquaculture is, requires different skills, specialized skills, and uh, we need to identify some synergies, identify some specialized skills so that um, the different experts across the globe can work together towards solving common problems. 
and also towards uh, empowering one another. When it comes to area number three, which is the infrastructure, uh, what comes in mind here is, uh, for example, uh, laboratories, specialized laboratories for diseases or genetic improvement programs. Um, as regions and as countries, we need to uh, work together towards sharing the infrastructure that is already in existence. Another area within the infrastructure can be also on uh, uh, production systems uh, that are uh, advanced in certain areas. So we can collaborate within that field as well. When it comes to information and knowledge sharing, um, different areas, different countries have invested uh, in, in research and thus have um, generated adequate information, knowledge and sharing. Instead of uh, different countries uh, or different regions reinventing the wheel, let's work together towards sharing information that is already generated and the knowledge uh, that is already there can then be transferred uh, between the, the regions. Finally, area number five, which is uh, technology development and transfer. Um, there are regions which are more advanced in terms of uh, aquaculture technology. Therefore, uh, it's important for areas that are less developed to work together with those that are uh, more advanced when it comes to technology uh, to leverage on the work that is already been done so that um, these areas can quickly develop their aquaculture through advanced technology and, uh, and the trans technology can then be transferred to those other uh, regions. This is all important, ladies and gentlemen, if we are to achieve a competitive and sustainable aquaculture sector globally that can contribute to our job creation, sustainable livelihoods, as well as food security. I thank you. Hello. Where are women in aquaculture production and value chains? The answer is not straightforward, but here are a few facts. First fact, data we have on women's participation is hazy, being either too aggregated or too case specific. But from what we know, there are large differences in the numbers of women involved depending on the type of production systems and their scale. More women are involved in small scale aquaculture enterprises, but often as unpaid helping hands. Women dominate the post harvest sector and are the main workforce in fish processing factories, often in low skilled positions. Far fewer are found at the head of large scale capital intensive operations. They also perform fundamental supporting roles as accountants in marketing, in sourcing inputs, but they will rarely become managers. This is the second fact. Women's engagement drops as production intensifies and scale and responsibilities increase. Yet, there are examples of success, of empowerment, economic freedom, improved nutrition for women who have engaged in aquaculture. But most of the time, these are from carefully designed gender sensitive interventions or the result of a long fight. This is the third fact. Benefits for women from aquaculture do happen, but they are not automatic. If women benefit more from aquaculture, then the entire sector will benefit and society at large too. So what can be done? First, greater scrutiny, because gender equality is not just about numbers, it is in the details and any aquaculture development has gender impacts. Aquaculture is multifaceted and gender issues are not the same everywhere and for everyone. So we need to pay attention to these details in our daily work. Second, an urgent transformation and rethink about the way we as aquaculture promoters do things if we want aquaculture to contribute meaningfully to the SDGs. This means, for example, developing aquaculture policies, toolkits, guidance and certification schemes that are gender sensitive and pay more than lip service to the issue. 
build gender equality targets in every aquaculture development strategy and review labor laws that support the sector. For example, recognizing the status of assisting spouse or giving land rights to women. Fund more research to understand better what supports or hampers women's contribution and progression in the sector. And finally, accelerate new or ongoing efforts to collect and use sex disaggregated aquaculture data. Women in aquaculture production and value chains are still invisible, ignored or unrecognized, but we all have a responsibility to change this. Thank you for your attention. Well, Thank you very much to our panelists for these uh, presentations. And I'm very pleased to learn that our FAO Deputy Director General Maria Helena Semedo has now just joined us in this webinar. And uh, we greatly look forward to hear her closing remarks later on. Thank you, Matthias, and uh, good afternoon to all. Hope this meeting is going well. Unfortunately, I couldn't join you from the beginning, but I'm here to listen from the conclusions, <laughs> not only my remarks, but to listen to the last panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. We now continue with uh, the question and answer portion of our webinar. Um, we will start first with um, a, a round giving opportunity to our panelists to pose a question to the lead author. And uh, we will go in reverse sequence of speakers now. So uh, Cecile, if you would like to start, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matthias. Um, and thank you, David, for a fantastic overview and so much food for thought. And my question relates to transformation. The options for ways forward um, call that you presented call on quite a significant change in the sector from its business as usual, and even you know, an important departure from uh, its past development trajectory as we are starting to realize that, that aquaculture can contribute more than tons or dollars. So from what you've seen in the reviews, um, where and who do you think will be the champions uh, leading the way or tri triggering such a transformation in the sector? Um, thank you, Cecile. Uh, I firmly agree that um, we do have to modify the, the trajectory of the sector, but um, bear in mind that the sector is growing. And I think um, we can't change the trajectory too much. I do think that NACA and FAO and other intergovernmental organizations, World Fish that works more closely on the ground, I think these will be the key um, champions of this new look and the new way to monitor aquaculture. I do think we have to look beyond tons and dollars. Um, FAO produces food balance sheets, but they are um, advertised or um, aggregated at a, at a national level, and they don't often look closely enough at the, the local conditions. Um, I think uh, your work with uh, gender analysis, Shakuntala's uh, look at uh, how to improve the nutrition, I think those will be extremely important in this new analysis. I do think that FAO and NACA um, has some work to do in regards to developing new markers that they can incorporate into Fish Stat J that, that do look at some of these measures of, um, of one health, of, of, local, um, of local benefits uh, and nutritional benefits. I think in, in with this, with the differences among the countries and the regions, I think developed countries um, will be probably have good resources to to look at this this new um, this new way of analysis. I think in developing countries 
or countries where fish is already a popular food item, I think um, it would be relatively easy, easier to, to incorporate these new measures. I think in places, uh, some places like we heard in Latin America where fish is not um, a big part of the diet, I, I think there will be more work needed to, to move aquaculture forward in those areas. So certainly um, food for thought and a good question to go into deeper analysis on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Devin, and um, for this comprehensive answer really. And uh, Bill Imani, may we move to you? May we have your question, please? All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Devin, for the very informative presentation on the status of aquaculture globally. Uh, my question and, and interest is uh, mainly on, on the issue of public perceptions. Uh, you alluded to the fact that uh, aquaculture continues to suffer from a poor public perception. And I can attest to that because um, uh, in my region, uh, in my country in South Africa, we still have the same same problem and uh, in some instances uh, the development of aquaculture has been halted and investors lost interest because of some of the protests particularly from the, the green NGOs. Uh, in your view or in your perception what kind of measures or interventions can we put in place to make sure that um, as countries and as a region and as a global aquaculture community we do change this uh, perception to be more positive so that agriculture becomes mainstream of uh, some of the economic activities. Thank you. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> thank you, Bela Manhim. Um, I agree that in some areas, um, aquaculture does su suffer from a, a, a poor public perception. And I think the way around this is to widely distribute, communicate science-based information on the, the many ways that aquaculture can improve food security in an environmentally friendly way. I think, um, especially in your region, there's some very good success stories about how aquaculture has, has changed perception. Uh, I think in other regions, we need to, to market those success stories more widely. I also think that we should bring the stakeholders that object to aquaculture together, have a stakeholder, stakeholder con, um, consultation, find out why they don't like aquaculture. And I would bet it's because of a mis, misconception. They don't know the facts. Um, bring those groups together and you can change hearts and minds. Um, I had the pleasure of teaching a class on uh, global issues in fisheries and aquaculture at Michigan State. At the beginning of the class, I would say 60% of the students said they wouldn't eat aquaculture products. At the end of the class, after I presented a lot of FAO material, FAO is great if you want to teach a class, not everybody, but that percentage had dropped to about 5% who said that they wouldn't eat uh, a farmed fish. So I think stakeholder engagement, proactive um, communication of the benefits of aquaculture based on science. I think that that's the way forward. Thank you for your question. Well, thank you very much, Devin, for sharing these insights and um, and maybe there is a possibility for these meetings now that we are all becoming experts on Zoom. Um, may we go to the next panelist, please, Shakuntala? Uh, will you ask your question, please? Thank you, Matthias. Um, and thank you, Devin, for presenting this summary with some excellent um, graphs and showing the latest uh, figures. I'd like to talk. To, I'd like to ask you a question about diversity, and I'm coming from the area I work in, um, the consumption of fish and other aquatic animals. And we do know that diversity on the plate of food and in the diet is a fundament 
of nutritious diets and healthy people. If you look at the production systems that you have described in your summary, we can see that some are based on monoculture systems, others are based on polyculture systems, and there's a vast range of everything in between. If you look at some of the data, in some countries, we see that an increase in aquaculture production leads to an increase in consumption at national level. Within some countries, we also have subnational levels where we can see that the, that the increase in consumption is, uh, is quite different from the different socioeconomic groups of the population. Moreover, we see that in some countries that the diversity of fish and other aquatic animals consumed decreases as the aquaculture share increases. And as I began by saying how important diversity is when you look at consumption patterns and the need for diversity for nutritious and healthy diets. Then I'd like to ask, how can aquaculture develop to ensure why diversity in production and consumption, and especially among the poor? And if it's possible if, to give an example from Africa, where I have seen that the development of aquaculture seems to favor very few species, and in particular, tilapia and catfish. Thank you. Um, thank you, Shakuntala, uh, for that, uh, that important question. And that's interesting what you say about uh, in some areas where uh, consumption has increased um, diversity has decreased. Uh, I think that's an interesting fact that probably should be examined more carefully. Now, as, as we've mentioned, aquaculture products are, are already very diverse, but maybe that is a, a national uh, measure of diversity. Maybe it's not a diversity on the plate in, in families' homes. Um, I do think that we can increase the diversity of aquaculture products um, that may include the use of non-native species, um, which are extremely important in agriculture and also very important in, in aquaculture. But there are issues uh, associated with that. Um, also, we mentioned that uh, genetic selection and the um, fortification uh, using fortified feeds can increase the um, diversity and the nutritional value of, of farmed products. Um, but one thing I didn't mention, and that is the marketing and consuming of smaller sized fish. Uh, we did mention that aquaculture usually wants to produce a big fish so they can sell it for lots of money, but actually producing a smaller fish that can be consumed whole um, increases the diversity and greatly increases the nutritional value of that, of that fish. And you yourself have demonstrated the, the value of those of eating the whole small fish um, around the world. So I, I think this is a, a, something that we could explore. And uh, I think farmers might be very happy to do this because they would just have to raise the fish um, for a shorter period of time. Um, as far as your example in Africa, uh, I'm sorry, maybe I would defer that to Bellamani or if you have a good example. Um, I'm, not, I'm not really um, ready to comment on that right now, but uh, I, I, think this, I think your question goes to this new analysis, a new way of looking at aquaculture. And I, I think maybe some, farming some of these small fish, um, we should look at that. I mean, I would think farmers would be happy to do that, but I'm not a farmer, I don't know. Thank you again for your question. Thank you, Devin. And uh, Belamani, would you like to pick up on that? Yes, um, th thank you for the question. Um, we, we do have uh, quite a number of, of markets uh, within South Africa and in some of the African countries. 
whereby uh, there's, there's preference to the this, this smaller uh, uh, fish, uh, mainly for economic reasons. And you find maybe at times uh, it's in the middle of the month and um, the person just wants to have uh, enough fish for, for themselves uh, or the family uh, for, 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 the, for the night. And these trends um, vary from uh, between the different times of the month, depending on, 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 the, on the economic reasons. So it's mainly economical. And yes, it does happen a lot here in, in Africa and South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Devin and Bilamani, for these answers. And uh, Shakuntala, uh, just congratulations uh, for your important role as uh, as Food Systems Ambassador in the UN Food Systems Summit 2021. Uh, we're very pleased to see you as a vice chair of one of the tracks there. And uh, it's great to have you holding up the flag for fish and nutrition. Um, very good. Um, that brings us to our next panelist, Antonio. It's your turn now. May I ask you to take the floor, please? Thank you, Matthias, and thank you, Devin, for the great presentation. I would like to congratulate all the panelists. My question, it will be simple, Devin, is uh, one of uh, proposed action to mobilize public and private funding for facilitating aquaculture growth is to integrate aquaculture into national development plans. Do you consider this a good general strategy given the disparity of aquaculture development in countries and objectives that aquaculture has in the, in the different countries in the world? In the different regions of the world, sorry. Yeah, uh, great. Thank you, Antonio, for that question. Um, I do think that it's important to integrate uh, aquaculture into those national development plans. There's, there's no other way that the sector can grow. And I do also believe that the government has a legitimate role in facilitating aquaculture development. Um, governments support a variety of, of enterprises from making cars, to making electronics, to, um, to subsidizing uh, terrestrial farmers. Now, there are good examples of these public-private partnerships that have helped the industry grow. In Latin America, in Northern Europe, um, these, this government intervention has been largely responsible for, for moving the sector forward until the sector can stand on its own two feet and then doesn't need those, those subsidies. And subsidies is often construed as a bad word there, there are good subsidies that can help um, any industry. And there are perverse subsidies that of course need to be, uh, need to be avoided. Um, so I believe in public-private partnerships. Um, governments can provide a safety net to, um, to aquaculture as it's, as it's growing. Um, however, one thing that I think would be important in this is to um, the establishment of farmer associations, uh, grower associations, so that um, the industry has a stronger voice in policy development and can help frame those partnerships. And these partnerships will be different in different parts of the world. Um, Latin America, where people don't eat fish, maybe the partnership would be government um, assisted communication on the, on the, on the health and environmental um, benefits of, of fish farming. Um, in in uh, areas where conservation is key, the government can help with, um, with, uh, with conservation and uh, environmental sustainability issues. So I, I, think, um, I think that public-private partnerships do have a way forward. In the recently released uh, State of the World Aquatic Genetic Resources, um, countries did mention that public-private partnerships um, can help the industry. Thank you. Uh, and again, it's something that we need to look more carefully into to make sure that we're not um, providing perverse subsidies and that we're not uh, marginalizing the small-scale um, enterprises that may not currently have a, a strong voice. That, uh, thank you for that question. 
Well, thank you very much for, for a first exciting round. And uh, it is 2.20 now, and uh, we do have time to, to take um, at least one or two questions from the question and answer box. And let me start with um, a question that really relates to your key message on innovations, Devin. And uh, there were a few questions in the chat actually asking about new technologies and innovations. Uh, for example, biofloc, probiotics, aquaponics, digital technologies, but also others. And um, yeah, I would like to pass this to, to Devin, but, but really also open it up to the other panelists. How can we support the, the transfer of good technology, of good practices, and eventually uh, build local capacity? Devin, would you like to start on that? And um, then others may, may add their views. Sure, maybe a very general, uh, general question is, um, one of the key, key factors of aquaculture growth and aquaculture development is extension services. Because as these new technologies arise, they often arise at a university or at a small scale. And those small scale or perhaps academic studies need to be transferred out to the mainstream producers through an effective extension network. Um, in the US, for example, uh, we have land grant universities with very well developed extension agents. And these are um, aquaculturists that know the industry and they know the science. They're a link between industry and, and, and innovation. So I think these um, uh, a well developed extension service is, is essential. And in, in many areas, they, um, they're lacking in many areas, they're beginning, but I think um, hopefully governments and universities can devote a little bit more resources to these very valuable extension services. And I'll, I'll hand it over to someone else now. Would one of the other panelists like to pick up on this? I agree with Shikantili here with this. Yes, I do agree with, with, with Devin, the extension services are important, but we've seen um, in some countries now that, uh, well, one thing that we've noticed that's that, is, that is important, that has been missing in many countries, that you have, that the knowledge is there, the knowledge is being, is 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 being given out, but perhaps not in the language that people understand, or not in the way that farmers can understand. And we've seen now with younger farmers that they are relying more on 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 on, on digital messages, and this could be a good way to reach some of the some of the um, producers, but perhaps not all. So there's a I would say, depending on your, on 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 who the producers are, you may need very different kinds of messaging and very different kinds of approaches to be able to to get the the technologies and innovations out to them. Thank you very much to both Devin and uh, Shikuntala. Um, I have another question yes. here from the Q and A box, which is for. Um, for Billy Money, can subsidies on feed be promoted to catalyze aquaculture growth in Africa? Short and sweet. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, the, the issue of sub subsidies is a very, very um, controversial one. But um, I think what uh, the governments, particularly in Africa, need to do is to in, invest in, in technology uh, that would, and, and, and also raw, raw materials and alternatives in terms of the raw materials to make sure that um, we produce a cheaper, affordable feeds, as we are aware that uh, feed will contribute about 60% of, of, of your total production cost. So I think uh, investment by government to, to ensure that there's more cost-effective feeds uh, are produced. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you very much. Um, there's one more question and I, I will um, ask uh, any of the panelists to respond to this if they feel uh, they are in a good place to do so. What role do you see for animal welfare criteria playing in sustainable aquaculture development? And this is of course a subject which is very, uh, um, very much dis, um, discussed in, in different parts of the world. Who would like to uh, take a first step at this? Evan, please. Yeah, I can just uh, give some general comments. Um, if you look at the FAO aquaculture certification guidelines, animal welfare um, figures prominently um, as one of the criteria to get uh, to, to be in line, to be compliant with those guidelines. Um, the reviews uh, all mentioned animal welfare. They didn't go into very much detail. It's just uh, an issue. Um, in many places, there are guidelines for the humane slaughter of, of aquaculture products of, of fish or, or shellfish. And I think this, um, this is important. Um, you do see lots of controversy about whether fish feel pain, whether they can be crowded. Um, I think there are signs that aquaculturists need to be aware of where animal welfare is not being respected. And that's quite easy, that's quite obvious. When your fish gets sick from overcrowding, um, that's not good animal welfare. So I think we've seen the industry um, improve um, uh, and it's in their best interest because they do not want fish um, dying or growing poorly because of poor growing conditions. So my main message is to look at those aquaculture certification guidelines and uh, aquaculturists, it's in their best interest to produce an environment that is safe and healthy for their product. I'll turn it Thank over. You. Thank you very much, Devin. Uh, we will conclude with a final question that came up in the Q&A box and it's a very uh, general one on how do you see the role of international cooperation for the sustainable growth of aquaculture? And I will ask Antonio to give a very brief answer. Please stay within a minute because we will then conclude. Antonio, please. Thank you, Matthias. Well, uh, just to be fast, I see international cooperation like a crucial uh, part of uh, the uh, development of aquaculture. We have seen the the subcommittee in aquaculture being a major tool of uh, us sometimes in the government are confined to small environments and this broadens the the minds of people that are working on the on, on, on aquaculture in, in different regions of the world um i also see different platforms as the world aquaculture society being a, a very important and uh, I, this is something i would like to uh, personally congratulate you because you have taken the lead of putting all, all of us together in this and sometimes uh, we have started working uh, together with World Aquaculture Society and, uh, and, and, the, and uh, the subcommittee in aquaculture, and it will be the cherry of the cake to have the, our meeting together next year in Mexico. Like I wanted to, to say that it's going to be very important for us having a joint meeting and being able to put all the participants together and uh, to have the same goals towards uh, uh, towards aquaculture development in many areas and not just government and, and science but every all the stakeholders all the stakeholders thank you so much antonio for this uh, very positive reference to uh, the subcommittee on aquaculture and its session next year in mexico well unfortunately this is all the time we have today for question and answers and uh, we will take note of all the questions and comments received we will pass them on to the authors to be considered in the finalization of the review. I would also like to alert you that all presentations will be made available as soon as possible. And please consult regularly our GCA website for updates. With this, I would like to ask Ma Madame Maria Helena Semedo, FAO Deputy Director General, to provide her closing remarks. Madame, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. And uh, again, a good afternoon to all. 
the panelists, the special guests, the participants in this today event. I could see that uh, it was very well attended. When I joined, I saw around 400 participants, but I can imagine in the beginning, it, it, you could have had more than uh, what I saw when I joined. And um, I could see that uh, this is a testimony of the importance of aquaculture and the team you discussed today. With the challenge in today's world, exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, the 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development remains our global blueprint to transform our world towards more sustainability and zero hunger, where no one is left behind. In this context, almost all the sustainable development goals and many associated targets are relevant to aquaculture development. And I am sure it has been part of your discussion today. As highlighted in the presentation on the regional reviews and the state of aqua, the world aquaculture, aquaculture can be a game-changing vehicle to help countries to deliver on the sustainable development agenda targets. And we clearly heard the call for sustainable aquaculture as part or a broader of the agri-food system transformation. And I could follow some of your discussion and I could see that it was underlined the importance of mainstreaming good governance, uh, good governance, nutrition. It has been said that aquaculture can bring more diversity to diets, also to gender, how we need to rethink the role of women to unleash the greater potential, youth, uh, I think how aquaculture can create employment and particular to youth. And some time back, I read an article saying that we need to look at aquaculture as a business where it can bring wealth to people. And this throughout the aquaculture value chain. And to this end, FAO has long focused on promoting sustainable aquaculture through the design and development of guidance and initiative. I think you talk uh, from some of those initiatives, some are, 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 are the rules and what FAO has in terms of legislation regarding aquaculture. And these processes are informed and instructed by our members, particularly to COFI and its subcommittee on, on, on aquaculture. This subcommittee is one of the most important instruments of implementation of the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries. FAO Blue Growth Initiative and the Common Vision for Sustainable Food and Agriculture provide a coherent and complementary framework for the sustainable and people-centered management of living aquatic resources and for a coordinated approach towards sustainability in all agriculture sectors, including aquaculture. And I, I follow some discussion where you said that we cannot see aquaculture in isolation. It has to be in the integrated in the global agriculture sectors. And building on both, FAO is developing guidelines for sustainable aquaculture and organizing the Global Conference on Aquaculture 2020 to be held in Shanghai, China in September 2021 to engage and enable aquaculture stakeholders to effectively participate in the implementation of the 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development. Dear participants, this type of normative work is essential for FAO's work. Just as is translating into target, targeted and effective action on the ground. And it was also said how we should work with the countries and to help the small uh, producers, particularly in Africa, it was a continent mentioned by several of, of the panelists. And this is why FAO is working on a blue transformation vision anchored on the need for sustainable, integrated, innovative, and inclusive aquaculture. 
around the world, but particularly where food is needed most. This vision closely aligns with FAO Hand in Hand initiative to deliver tangible benefits, especially for smallholders in less aquaculture developed countries and regions that need our support most. Aquatic systems can and must play a larger role in reducing hunger and malnutrition. And this brings to me to the importance it has stressed of collaboration, partnership, and resource mobilization. Also, you refer to, to the importance of having policies, practice, approach, which should be context specific, which should consider the culture, the ecosystem, and economic environment. You also refer to the need of new innovation, how we can bring new and good technology, good practices, and also the importance of extension services as a, a vehicle to, to technology or good practices transfer. And partnerships, not only among regional aquaculture networks, but with professional societies, aquaculture research and development initiatives, value chain actors, civil society organization, intergovernment uh, agencies are also criti critical to further facilitate sustainable aquaculture, innovation and integration. But also you call for the need for investments, how we should have the capital and how the financing flows and policies will be aligned with economic, social and environmental priorities including for aquaculture. We need greater and more meaningful collaboration and engagement with donor community to implement actions. Let me conclude by reminding us of the realities and hardship faced by the world farmers and food producers every day especially facing the challenge of COVID-19. And we know that the fishery sector has been highly reached by COVID-19. Today, we have had a snapshot of aquaculture as one of the world's most diverse food producing sectors. And you refer, as I refer already, the diversity on, on fish, the diversity on our plate on our diets and with the potential to accelerate our common fight against hunger, against poverty and against inequality. And I think it has already been shown in Sophie that the, the consumption of fish, of fish products will come mainly for aquaculture in the years to come. And with your support and commitment, Tomorrow, aquaculture will play its key role in transforming our agri-food systems and achieving our sustainable development vision. Let's keep together, let's work together, and let's really transform aquaculture for better uh, production, better uh, sustainability, and main for better equality. This is what is important. Thank you again for your participation. Stay safe, stay healthy in these very difficult moments. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Madame Semido, for these inspirational closing remarks and reminding us all of the role that sustainable and responsible aquaculture has for food security and nutrition. This brings us to the end of an exciting webinar and an exciting week uh, reviewing aquaculture around the globe. I wish to thank everyone once again, uh, our lead author, Devin Bartley, our panelists, Antonio, Shakuntala, Belemane and Cecile, as well as our senior officials, uh, Manuel and Deputy Director General, Madame Semedo. The webinars this week were organized for you by the aquaculture team here at FAO, under the overall coordination of my colleague Uwe Bark. And I would like to thank him 
and the other webinar moderators, Alessandro Lovatelli, Anna Menezes, Pierre Murichesi, Austin Stankes, and Miao Waimi. Thanks are also due to the many people working behind the scenes who made this event and the reviews themselves a reality. And finally, a special thank you to all of you for attending. This was an awesome week for aquaculture enthusiasts, and we hope you have enjoyed our webinars as much as we did. Wherever you are, stay safe, take care, and we look forward to seeing you all at the Global Conference on Aquaculture in Shanghai in September next year. Bye-bye.